Chicago's 1971 live album was a mammoth release for its time. The group had released three double albums in a row, and even with the band's success, their label Columbia Records wasn't too thrilled with the idea that they were going to put out a four-disc live album. According to the group, they felt strongly enough about the idea that they suggested they would take a lower royalty rate per album in order to make the Carnegie Hall release feasible. As history now shows, they had a large enough stack of hits that whatever money they left on the table in 1971, they've more than made up for that at this point. But the album itself, when it arrived, was a disappointment from a sonic standpoint. Trombonist James Penko famously griped that the horn section sounded like kazoos, and as Lee Lochnane tells UCR, the entire band felt that the album just didn't sound as good as it should. Fifty years later, there's good news for both the band and Chicago fans. There's a new expansion of the live set called Chicago Carnegie Hall Complete, presenting all eight of the shows that were recorded for the live record in their entirety. It's an incredible set that writes the sonic wrongs and puts you in the seats there at Carnegie Hall for the entire April 1971 run. Different set lists each night, and it captures the band at their peak. We had the chance to speak with Lee Lochnane to talk about the new box set. Here's our conversation. How you doing? I'm doing real good, man. Great to have you on the phone here. How, how's things going on your side of things? Pretty good. I just, uh, I'm in Scranton. I got here last night, like a 12-hour trip <laughs> from uh, Arizona. I know that after that, you got to be glad to be where you are in Scranton then, if that, if it was that kind of journey. That's right. Well, it just takes that long to get across the country. Oh. And then, you know, there's, you're through, all of a sudden you're three hours later. So it's, you, you know. How have you done 50 plus years of that, Lee? The travel has always been the hardest part, I must say. Yeah. You know, we, we get paid for traveling, not playing shows. All right, man. Well, digging into this, I know that the Carnegie tapes were not in great shape, and that is the real journey here, restoring all the music, getting it to a place where it could be considered for a release. As far as the tapes themselves, I wondered if you knew where those were, like what sort of search or process was it locating them? Because obviously there was the initial expansion of the original album in 2005, which adds an extra CD of material. So the recordings were looked, they were, they were looked at at the time by Jeff Magid, but that's a long time from then to now. So I kind of wondered what that part of the process looked like. Uh, well, I don't think Jeff and I ever, ever went through all, you know, I didn't realize there was 41 tapes of the Carnegie Hall project because I never foresaw that, that we would be doing uh, a complete package where we would be mixing and mastering all eight shows. So uh, that never even entered our mind. But the tapes, as it turned out, were they were in good shape. They just had a lot of noise and, and a lot of stuff that we had to get out of the way first before we could even start editing and mixing. And, and that's just as a result of playing in a place like Carnegie Hall, which is built for classical music. Yeah. So there's a lot of noise right off the bat, and you got to get rid of as much noise as you possibly can, so you can somewhat control how much Carnegie Hall you're going to use, because there's going to be plenty left even after we clear as much stuff as we can out where you can actually hear the notes. And you've talked in interviews about having to fix the performance of Someday, which opens the whole Carnegie run. That made me wonder, like, what were some of the other really challenging songs or sections in this set that kind of put you and Tim through the paces? There was there are thousands of <laughs> things that put us through the paces, and that, that's why it took ten months to actually, you know, complete the project. But you know, we just took something looked impossible. You just start getting into it, look at one step at a time, and by the end, by by the time you get to the end of it, you go, I think that sounds pretty good now. <laughs> you know, whatever it it might be, uh, just that you couldn't hear stuff well enough. So we had to get everything else out of the way so you could hear it. And, uh, you know, it's just a, a work of love. You know, it was, it was fun to do, interesting, it kept me a really busy during the pandemic. And uh, <laughs> I would have done nothing else rather than what I was doing. Jimmy is on record for being, you know, uh, I think especially critical out of all the band members as far as the original uh, release of this set. So I wondered from the outset, how viable did the idea of even doing this seem to you, Lee? I didn't know what I was going to get involved with, but I had the same feelings that Jimmy did. The entire band thought that the, the album just didn't sound as good as it should. 
And um, we, we, we were all wrong because it sold a million copies anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> everybody loved and still loves that album. So to recreate it, or not recreate it, but to, to mix shows that were never even heard um, was a, a bit of a challenge in itself. And then we have to pass uh, if the, the muster of the fans. <laughs> and uh, you being included in it, I'm assuming. Sure, absolutely. And and uh, what I realized as we started doing this is how good the band was actually playing at the time. Yeah. And you know the we we just had uh, performance energy. We always loved playing for people, and uh, that's really all we were doing. We this this was a, a six day run with eight shows and that was in between. I know this became, you know, an hi- historical document for us. And, but before that we played shows leading up to it. And as soon as we finished, we flew back to the West coast and played. Uh, uh, I think we had one day off a travel day and, and then played wherever we were next. So it was in the middle of an ongoing tour. And um, and then after we finished playing it, we never heard it again until it came out as the record. Hmm. So when we heard it, we went, oh, yeah, you know, we you know we were hoping it would sound better than it did, and we were always disappointed that it didn't sound the way we wanted. And uh, fifty years later, the technology exists where you can make stuff that you can you can do things that were not sonically possible in 71. So Tim and I, I think, put the audience, I know I felt myself when I was sitting there listening to it, like I was sitting in the audience listening and almost visualizing everybody on stage. Yeah. It was, it was uncanny. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and for you, like going through this, um, entire run of shows, like what are some of your favorite performances from the run? (laughs) Uh, you know, each song had its own set of, of, um, uh, challenges as we talked about, but when I listened to the songs, it was always fun playing each one of them as we were doing it. And that, that type of feeling still exists today. I mean, the songs that these guys wrote. And I only, I, I'm like a two hit wonder out of the 50 years, right? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the, Jimmy and, and Robert and Terry, and uh, as it turned out, Satara later on, were writing songs that, that have never, we have never gotten tired of. And when we did Carnegie Hall, there were, there were three albums to choose from. And uh, so we were still mixing in stuff that we had done in the clubs back then. Uh, but, you know, the, the only one that we continued doing was because it was on the first album, I'm a Man. Yeah, we did. We did that every night for we're still doing it every night, you know, 50 years of, of one song. And, and I don't think we ever got the lyrics right. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> we, we played we played England and uh, and Spencer Davis came back and said, where did you get those lyrics? Man? You know, and, you know, we, it's just what we picked up off the off with listening to the records. That was it. There was no Google back then, so you couldn't look up what the actual words were. Well, one of the great <laughs> one of the great things about this set is the banter, both from the band and the audience right. in between the songs. Um, a friend who also has this set wanted to know about the frequent shouts of Ludwig throughout the show, which he presumes from came Walt. from he presumes that came from Walt. Um, do you know was that an inside joke of some sort within the band? Like, what do you recall about that? It was an inside joke for Walt. I. I'm still trying to figure out what it was too. I'm, I'm <laughs> figuring that it was because we were playing Carnegie Hall and he was shouting out to Ludwig von von Beethoven. I think. Oh yeah, that's a good point. Ludwig, yeah. you know. So that's my best guess. Well, this set really, um, as you mentioned, highlights the improvisational nature of this band. And you know, there have been similar sets which can feel kind of redundant because the band or the artist, whoever it is. 
they just walk out on stage and play the same set every night. And that's really what's cool about this. Like Chicago was playing a different set list every night. And I really appreciate um, that the tuning and the warm up at the beginning of the set was left in because as you're listening to the band tune up, like things start to come together. All of a sudden it's like, hey, cool. I think they're going to open with listen. And sure enough, you all segue right into listen after the band's introduced. And I mean, Lee, as you know, these days, as fans, like we're also used to being able to go on Setlist FM and just see what the set list is going to be for the show that we're going to go see. And this right. really does kind of take you back to the feeling and the mystery of going to see a show uh, and that anticipation of finding out, like, what are they going to play next? Like you, you talked about exactly. you talked about being able to, like, you know, sit in the audience and feel like you were at these shows. And this set really like delivers that, which is cool. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was uh, I, I was proud that Tim and I were able to actually put it together where it's it for me in its event it's an event yeah and that's saying something because of from where I started and my thoughts and perceptions of what these shows were and represented for us it completely changed my mind by the time we got to the end of it and I'm proud that I had something to do with it from the beginning right till now and uh, so it was it was fun from beginning to end and then mentioning the improv performances that are plentiful throughout this box set, I mean, these shows really kind of showcase how the band, uh, I think it's Jimmy Pardo in the in the liner notes that, you know, talks about how Chicago was like, you know, really in that era, like a jam band on the level yeah. of like, you know, what we would consider like Dave Matthews Band and Grateful Dead to be at this point. So it, it showcases how the band could have gone in more of a Grateful Dead or Steely Dan direction long term. And in fact, there was an article years back from Robert Lamb talking about how he had a love-hate relationship with Steely Dan's Asia, in part because it represented what he thought Chicago um, should have been doing musically at the time. So I guess the question is, like, why do you think the band did not stay with more of a jazzy improv direction like we hear here on these, Chicago, uh, on these Carnegie performances? Well, the, the, the business was changing at the time, too. Yeah. If, if you remember, back uh, in 71, they were still... The record companies were still paying on on unlimited copyrights for an album, so you could write uh, a few songs or fifteen songs, and and everyone got paid um, a, a correct amount of royalty. Whether whether the royalties are, have ever been uh, uh, you know based on on uh, the songwriter or the record company, it, more to the record company forever, you know. But but anyway. They paid on multiple copyrights, and then all of a sudden, they decided that they were only going to pay 10 copyrights per album. That completely changed the entire business and the way songwriters uh, looked at songs. Because if we wrote 11 or 12 songs, then the, then the songwriter is going to have to start sharing royalties, which were, which were fairly low in the first place, unless you were extremely successful. So I think that... that materially affected how songwriters wrote they knew there was only going to be like three three minutes and 30 seconds on on the radio because they weren't going to play anything longer than that of course until the beatles came along and, and did an ending that never stopped uh, repeating itself and then you know paul was screaming over the top of it so. <laughs> la 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 <laughs> And now the the entire audience sings it every night, so it's great. But that was like a twelve minute ending. As far as I, I, it was probably seven or something like that. But because they were the Beatles, they knew it was going to get played. Yeah. Now we didn't feel that they would play seven minute endings for us. Hmm. And uh, maybe they might have, but that's not the way we went. And we started, uh, you know, you started thinking that if you don't have the audience by the first you know, four or five seconds, they're going to change the song. So we tried to really impact, you know, um, get someone's attention quickly. I think that was more of the intent. And we tried to keep the same, you know, reaching out to change something quickly and not sound like it's rote, hmm. yeah. not sound like it's like it's a, a, a form of how how something should be done still trying to change the scope of of writing in the midst of it 
and uh, make it sound new and fresh. During the actual week of shows, um, what do you remember being challenging in the run or funny moments and things that happened off stage? Oh my God, I can't remember back that far. I'm, <laughs> I'm really... <laughs> I knew we were, you know, I was drinking and smoking weird stuff at that time too. So you never knew what I was thinking. I was, I was probably thinking, you know, a lot of stuff about me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so to kind of flip the question a little bit, did listening to the shows, did that bring out anything that you had kind of forgotten about? I remembered a lot about how we were playing songs at the time and what we were doing on stage and where we were standing. Those things started flooding back in. But actual specifics of, of uh, uh, you know, like intimate things that we were doing at the time uh, you know like i said i'm trying to figure out what ludwig meant <laughs> yeah because he, he said it so many times but uh i remember it being fun we always had fun doing it initially when we started playing carnegie hall we were nervous and we finally settled into getting comfortable with it because once you play a place you know a, a one or two times you start getting used to the acoustics, no matter what they are. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as you can hear now there, you could probably hear through the challenges that we had because Carnegie hall just sort of takes over. And we had, we had challenges because there were two machines and one of the machines, uh, electronically started having problems during the course of the eight shows. Oh, geez. Yeah, so we had to to uh, figure out ways around that. There was, you know, when I say thousands of problems along the way, there were thousands. Not, there were thousands of problems, and uh, you know, controlling that one machine was was a difficult project in itself. Yeah, it, it would start it would start sounding more um, distorted. Oh, okay. And, and it wasn't really distorted, but we had to control the sound of the distortion. So, so you talked about like hearing the way you used to play some of these songs. Was there exactly. a particular like arrangement that like kind of struck you? Like, why did we move away from doing it that way? Um, the only reason we would move away from doing it a particular way is because that's the way the song developed through the years. Yeah, sure. It, there, there was no particular we don't like the way this is going. We should change it. It just sort of changed naturally organically. And, um, uh, uh, we truncated some things now that used to be longer back then. And I, you know, I don't remember exactly the time when it happened. It was just, it brought up, Hey, you know, we could change this. Let's do Let's try it this way. You know, let's do a solo here rather than not over here. Just, you know, various things to change things up a bit. And, uh, and also during that time, when you say we were the, you never knew what the set list was going to be, that were, there was a lot less production. So the, if you wanted to move around some, the, you know, the guy, the front of house guy just turned up another mic, but uh, you had to watch what was going on. Now, the the um, the production is at a point where the lights, the sound, the monitors, everything else. When you change a song, everybody's got to know, or you don't hear or see something. Yeah, everything's synchronized now. Yeah, that really exactly. came through. Like, because some nights you would open with, you know, on this run, you'd open listen, you know, with listen on one night, as I mentioned. Another night you'd yeah. open with, you know, in the country. So, it, like, that really sticks out. Like, you know, just how much more flexibility you had with the set list. Like, uh, right. you know, an hour in the shower is in the set list one night, and then another night it's not. You know, so it, it was only in the set list one night out of the out of the eight shows. Yeah, yeah. So. We only did hour in the shower once. And, and that's one of those shouts that came from the audience. And, and Terry, because we weren't doing it that night, Terry said, you know, we might come tomorrow. If you, and so maybe you want to come tomorrow, too. <laughs> We that's, might be doing it tomorrow. <laughs> that's one of the things that's really stuck out to me about this set is that years back, you guys released like a CD compilation kind of highlighting the work of Terry Kath. And it's like yes. this set, this Carnegie set, you get a whole lot of Terry Kath on this set. You get a lot of Terry Kath because he plays a different solo on, and on the same song on different nights. Yeah, whether it's South California Purples or what it, whatever it is. 
Yeah. Whatever it is, he goes where the music takes him. It was awfully sad uh, to read earlier this year about Walt's diagnosis of Alzheimer's and the dynamic between the three of you on stage over the years was really something to watch as a fan. What's one of your favorite Walt stories? We always had fun on on stage and we were always, I think we had more fun watching the audience than the audience had watching us. And uh, so we, we would, we would pick out a guy in the audience or a girl that looks like someone else. So that entire night, they were a different person. They were who we decided they were. And, you know, that would take uh, uh, precedence in some of the things we were doing on stage. All of a sudden you would say that, uh, you know, uh, Alfred Hitchcock is out there. You know, <laughs> you start making jokes about Alfred Hitchcock. So <laughs> you That's never knew awesome. what was going to happen or what we were going to talk about, but it was always loose and, uh, the music never suffered, I don't think. What do you recall about that dynamic and that chemistry <laughs> coming together between you and Walt and Jimmy? That it astounded me when we were playing in the studio or on stage that we would um, play something that was sometimes incorrect, but we would all do it together and then look at each other and go, how did we do that? You know? And, and it was, it was dumbfounding, but when you play with someone long enough, you start doing things like that. And it was, it was, uh, it was cool to see it happen and hear it happen. David Wilde writes in the liner notes for this set, quote, at its best, Chicago was always a team sport. So, what does it yeah. feel like as that team really begins to gel? Because, I mean, Peter Cetera is no slouch on the base, which this set really highlights. I mean, I already mentioned Terry, Ga- Terry Kath, um, Danny Serafin. You can go on right down the line. What are kind of your memories of jamming with these guys in the early days prior to the first record? Like, what are you picking out about each of them as you're playing? That we were good players and we played uh, the inadequacies. We overlooked inadequacies and just went with the flow of where the song was going and and didn't and, you know we might have complained about it afterwards how come you're playing it so fast how come you're playing it so slow those those kind of comments would come in quite often after a show but but during the show it didn't matter you played what was right in front of you what you were hearing you played along with and the team effort that it took to do that, I think, shows through on this project. So there's a new Chicago record in the works. And if I've, yes. read, if I've read correctly, you all have been doing at least some songwriting with Jim Peterick for that one. I know there was the song that came out last year, partially from the pen of Jim. What else can you kind of tell us about the new record? Only Robert has written songs with uh, okay. Jim Peterick. Yep. But uh, other than that, we, you know, initially we didn't... Uh, we weren't planning on a Chicago project and then this sort of blossomed during the pandemic. Nice. And, and exactly at the time when I was doing the Carnegie hall project. So I couldn't really put that much time into the Chicago project until the Carnegie hall was done. And uh, so, but I still have a couple songs that are probably going to be on this, the new Chicago album. I just don't know. It's probably going to come out next year. Cool. So, this one's out now, so that's why we're talking about it first. So final question here. We have this Carnegie Live set. Um, there was the live box set a few years ago, and prior to that, the Live in 75 double CD release. What else is there in the vaults from a live perspective that you'd love to see come out? Um, I didn't know if there was any sort of similar expansion along the lines of this Carnegie run that's in the vaults. Like, are there a bunch of shows with Chicago and the Beach Boys, like stuff like that? Does that stuff exist? I don't know if we ever did anything in multi-track. Yeah. There may be some recordings, but nothing that we could break out like we have done the Carnegie Hall project. I I don't think there is, but who knows? I mean, maybe we did something that I don't recall, but I don't think so. Jeff Maggot would probably know more because he and I sat down initially when we uh, we were considering uh, selling the masters. Hmm we had to find all the masters and verify what was on each tape and who played it and all of that stuff. And, uh, that was a lot of fun. 
going back, you know, realizing that while we were while we were recording, it was going so quickly yeah. that sometimes the second engineer didn't have enough time to to um, authenticate or write down what exactly happened. So uh, when when uh, Jeff and I listened to the tapes, we were able to figure it out because I remembered or we actually heard it, you know, but it wasn't on the box itself. So oh. we, were able, we were able to add it to the box. You know, it's a lot of guesswork, but, but Jeff knew what the boxes looked like and what, you know, th this is uh, something important. He could tell by looking at the stuff because he's done it. He's an archivist and he's done it quite often for different bands. All right. Final thing that you just made me think of just as far as like, you know, finding stuff that wasn't written on the boxes and stuff like that. It kind of yeah. struck me as I was getting ready for this interview that um, you and Jimmy and Walt did not do as much outside session stuff as one might expect. And what you just said kind of really highlights that you guys were so busy as a band, but I wondered, do you have a yeah. good story from the work that you guys did with the Bee Gees? In, in uh, Florida. Yeah, that, that was fun. We only did uh, a couple of songs. Yeah, we did. We did. It was, it was I think it was just Walt and I and we did. Uh, yeah, it was, it was like one or two songs. Did I play on both songs? I think Walt and I played the, the intro for uh, No More. Yeah, Too Much Heaven, right? Oh, too much heaven. Thank you. Yeah, there we I, go. I can remember the music, but not the title. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, what was the other song that we played on? Too Much Heaven and then Search, Find. So, obviously not one of the better known uh, songs in the Bee Gees catalog. But, yeah, two songs from that record. <laughs> Search, Find. Search, Find. In this case, Lee searches and tries to find what was the other song we played on. So That's right. And it's going around in a circle. Yeah. Trying to find something. <laughs> That's funny. It's like, it's like the computer, like the spinning circle, you know, you know, before exactly. you get to the blue screen. So there that, you go. That's the, I don't know. <laughs> but did you have some, was it fun like hanging with those guys? Yeah. And the, that's cool. you could see how, how intense they were in the studio. And Walt and I didn't realize that they were checking our tuning. They were sticklers for tuning, for intonation. And they had a, they had a, um, a triple beam, uh, not a triple beam. They had a, a, a an oscillating uh, tuner in the studio. So as we played a note, they were they were seeing if it was in tune or not. They were they were uh, complimentary to us when we went into the studio to listen and said, "You guys really play in tune." Well, yeah, yeah aren't you supposed to? You know, <laughs> you know, we were surprised that they were even asking us. Well, I'm I'm happy it came up where you know it stopped right in the center because if it goes. To the left, it's flat. If it goes to the right, it's sharp. And we were we were pinning it right in the center. So uh, yeah, that's sort of like we like to do that. That's fantastic. <laughs> well, Lee, I tell you what, man, I am so happy uh, that for fans that this Carnegie set exists. Like it really is just a fantastic trip. So worth yeah. all the ten months that you put into it. So thank you for doing that, man. Thanks, Matt. Great talking to you. Have a great one. Take care, Lee. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. That's Lee Lockdane of Chicago. Check out chicagotheband.com for more information on the Carnegie Hall complete box set that we discussed today. Find more from Chicago by clicking the link in this video's description and make sure to subscribe to our UCR channel here on YouTube for all the best news and history of classic rock and pop culture.